Welcome to this week's program. Everybody is absolutely totally over winter, so we thought we would brighten your week up by showing you some of the stories that we've done when the weather was okay and the temperatures were warm. Big is beautiful, and the Clydesdales and, and the draft horses, Tim, always get a crowd, don't they? Mm, yeah, they're certainly crowd pleasers. So it's a, it's a breed or a type of horse that's never really lost its popularity? No, they went out as workhorses probably in the 1950s, the last of the teams were you know, working, but then after that this, people bought them and they went into the tourist game, the tourist industry with them a bit. Um, some of the little farms still used them a bit up until the 70s, but now they're virtually just a, an entertainment animal now, people have got them just for their own pleasure. They're very, very quiet in spite of their size. In general, yeah, in general, but they're like all horses, you can get the odd one that's a bit nasty and when you get a bad one they're bad because of their size. <laughs> I reckon that would be dead right. Yeah. So what are the judges looking for Tim? <clears throat> well in the Clydesdale you're looking for a horse with a nice big broad foot, flat bone, uh, when they go out, when they're going out in the ring they like to see them move away from them with plenty of action, plenty of hock action, because the Clydesdale was renowned as a horse that could walk at a fast speed. And once again, like in the old um, days they used to have work bullocks. Bullocks will only do a mile and a half an hour, whereas a Clydesdale will do, a good Clydesdale is three mile an hour. So they got over the ground, whether they were ploughing or carting yeah, produce to the wharves or the railheads, whatever. So it was their, their, their action that really set the Clydesdale apart from the other breeds. How do you keep them fit? Well today none of them are fit because they're not working. They're really only hobby animals now. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say they were very fit. Now, the other thing that suddenly started to appear is gypsy cobs and, and such. Mm -hmm. That's another branch of the heavy horse. Yeah, well, they're, they're more an English horse. The, the gypsies over there, the travellers use them. Um, that's where they originated. But they seem to become a bit of a fashion statement at the moment. There's a, a lot of people buy them, I think, just for their looks and their colour. Um, but I was over in England this year and I, I went to one or two big villages and there's still quite a lot of gypsies there using them in the traditional way. You see them camped on the big motorways over there, there'll be flyovers and clover leaves and that, a bit of vacant land in between, the gypsies will be camped there with the gypsy cobs. So they still use them over there a bit. Most of their, most of their vehicles are motorised. But... Isn't it nice though that they are still around and they are being brought back into back. fashion again? Yeah, yeah, it's, they're at the crossroads at the moment, you know, there's a, younger people are coming on that um, are interested in heavy horses, but they're, they're keeping them more and more now as a oh, fashion statement, I suppose you'd say, or, you know, to ride and that, but they're not working as much as they used to. They're, they're, um, they were bred to work, and that part of the, the, the heavy horse is fast disappearing, the work side of it. Probably the only way they're going to survive into the future is as a, a riding horse or, you know, museum horse or something. Now, you're from Australia, how do we compare to Australian breeds? Well, you've still got the, the Clydesdale here, still the traditional Clydesdale, that they would have worked in the 1930s and 40s, like size-wise, height-wise and that. Australia and other places like Scotland, the home of them, they've gone for a bigger horse, mainly for the, the market. Most of the big wagon teams, they like big, showy horses. And in America, of course, America likes everything yeah, big and better. And a lot of the Scottish horses go to America, so the Scots are breeding a, a bigger horse now. But, but I'd have to say here, they're more the traditional breed still. Well, you find all sorts of characters at the Canterbury AMP show, and Chris, I'm going to put you in that category. But tell me about the chaff chaps. How did it get started? So we started in 2014. I used to own a mushroom farm and we needed some chaff cut for our, our mushrooms to grow on. And um, because for oyster mushrooms you need it on nice little short wheat straw, not long stuff that you grow button mushrooms on. And so we tried lots of different options around how to do that. And finally I met this old guy who said, Chris, you've got to buy a chaff cutter. And I said, well, that's great, but where do you find one of these? So talked to lots of chaff cutters. No one wanted to cut chaff for me uh, because wheat straw is just a pig of a process to cut. And so we finally found this guy over in Swananoa who said to me, Chris, I'll do it for you, but you need to buy a chaff cutter. 
One thing led to another and we finally found this chaff cutter down in Southland. We bought that, brought it back up here, then found we needed to have a steam engine to drive it. Yes. Not quite a steam engine, but that was basically what it was. Without the traditional source. Exactly. <laughs> and we believe in being back to the basics, which is why our machine's 113 years old. And so we bought this chaff cutter for doing the mushrooms. Then we looked at it and said, I only need it for about one day a fortnight. And that's a little bit silly. So we had a few conversations with Rob, my business partner, and said, why don't we just cut some chaff? And so we asked around, we did some research, we found that there was a shortage of Timothy chaff. And so one thing led to another, and the chaff chaps were born. A few coffees, a few beers. And yeah. So you market, I mean, you, nobody sort of thinks about chaff, but then there is obviously a market. There's a massive market. Uh, there's something like about 80,000 recreational horses in New Zealand uh, without getting into the, the performance horses, the racing horses and all the rest of it. So there's a big market out there for horses um, and most of those need some chaff at some point. Um, so there's a massive market there for chaff and most of it is dominated by loosing, which is a little bit over the top in terms of a horse feed. The Timothy's a much, much better option for horses um, it's more palatable, it's got, it's slightly, slightly less protein, but it has no end of fight. So you don't get heat up with your horses. Um, so your horses are much more easily manageable. Um, and we've got a lot of trainers now that are starting to use it and just commenting on how much more relaxed the horses are. Because to some, it, it's actually a health product for horses. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, we, and we've got a number of customers who are ardent fans of it in, from a health perspective. And if you've got ponies um, and stuff, Timothy's the best way to go. So let's run through some of the, the attributes because you're talking about Cushing disease and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So the, the Timothy, because of the, the nature of, of the feed there, then you don't end up with a lot of those metabolic types of um, issues. So laminitis, um, all of those sorts of things are not problems with, with using Timothy. And all of those things, you can end up with problems with loosening. So how do you keep it weed free? So we get it grown in Southland. Um, we have a very good grower down there. We, we've tried getting it out of Canterbury, uh, but it just doesn't seem to grow very well here. Um, so we have a very good grower down in Southland and um, he knows what he's doing. He's been growing it for a long time. Um, and yeah, he provides us with a great product. Well, Chris, here's your chance for a commercial. How do people find you? So you can find us at www.thechaffchaps.co.nz. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Um, or just email me, info at thechaffchaps.co.nz. So obviously presentation is very, very important. And you as a groomer, apparently that's an international trade. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> No, I come over from Australia and yeah, helping out our stewards over here, so no, it's pretty good. So how big a demand is there? I mean, there must be a lot of shows with a lot of cattle. Yeah, there is. Over home, so, yeah, pretty fair big demand over in Australia and over here, and no, it's a pretty good industry to get involved in. So what do you do? Because they, they look pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, you just like sort of clip them all off and just get them to show the best, best features off and yeah, make them look nice and sweet. I mean, you've got across the, across the whole animal, you've got sort of areas where it's very well trimmed and other areas where you've got the, the, the hair standing up. Yep, no, we're just trying to make them look as best as they can with what, like, yeah, just make them look the best and show off everything you can do. There's always a few things you can do to them. Do you oil them at all or is that...? Yeah, yeah, give them like a nice shiny coat and brush them all down and clean them all up and a bit of paint. And of course the tails get a fair bit of attention. Yeah, no, you fluff them out, yeah, look, make them look nice. <laughs> so how do you learn your trade? Uh, just off other people, how they, just learning and watching other people, yeah. And you've been doing it for a while? Oh, I've been doing it probably a couple of years, yeah. So you just sort of just learn off the people that have been doing it most of their life and, so yeah. What, but you obviously do it continually, I mean, you don't just set them up on the Wednesday and then leave them. No, nah, you got to do it continuously, like, probably takes a month or so, a couple of months to get them on their diet and eating right and everything. So yeah, there's a fair bit of preparation to get them all right before a show. Yeah, the other thing is that 
I was astounded to find out that there's people here 24 hours of the day. What are they doing on the night shift? Uh, you just got to make sure they're eating and like one's not getting sick or something or too cold and getting dirty and yeah, just got to keep an eye on them pretty much around the clock. Because if a tail starts to lift, there's people rushing in with buckets. Yep, <laughs> so it's not such a messy job after it. <laughs> and you must be you must be very proud of the way that these, these animals have come up. Yeah, they come up really good. So we've come a long way from being in a paddock really hairy and dirty. So, no, nah, it's pretty good to see like the progressive stage of it all. And they're nice and quiet. Yeah, nice and quiet, yep. <laughs> Haven't got kicked yet. <laughs> So what's your next move? Where to from here? Uh, back home. Got a bit of farm work to do at home, so then I come back in January. So yeah, that's no, pretty good. Mr. President, it's a, it's a big show for you. It is indeed. It's um, it's a privilege to be the um, be the president and head this um, this prestigious show that we have in here in Canterbury. And it is really big. It's it's the country's top one, really. Well, it's, it's the biggest, and that, that's based on, on the number of people who come through the gate, um, uh, the, the, the number of livestock exhibits and, and the trade exhibits. There's a, bit of, there's a formula there which, which gives us that, um, that, that, that status. So. Of course, the James family have always been very supportive, and they will be this year with you president and your own cattle here. That's correct, um, Rob. We've, once again, we've got a big team of cattle. We've been doing it for, for many years now, and um, yes, we've got about 15 animals of our own here this year in, in the limousin section. So. Now, the volunteers, let's let's give them a bouquet. They are, they are wonderful. Five, about 500 of them. Just that, that's stewards and just um, people marshalling and and just um, people just generally doing things just just to help make this event work. It, it is incredible. And it's, it's the only way that it can work. It's um it's uh, if we had to pay all those people, we wouldn't be here today. So it's, and it's interesting that they all get the job done. Nobody seems to stand over them. That's right. They, everyone knows what they've got to do, and, and you just let them go, and, and it just happens. On the day, the, the show goes on, and here we are today. So it started the, the show. The promotional team have been working for Very good. Months. We've got a great um, staff at uh, TDM in, in, in the office there. Um, the contracted to do all that, all that work and, and, and run the, the minister, minister the show, and they do a wonderful job in there. They're just, they're just busy, busy people, and, and a wonderful crew to work with. It's been a pleasure I mean, as the president working with that lovely staff we have having there in the office. And of course you'll have celebrities and politicians and such coming in through the gate. Yes they do. They, they, they seem to like coming to, to coming to Canterbury and there's, there's a number, there's an MPI function which um, Nathan Guy is going to be hosting later in the week and um, yes they, he'll have be a number of um, There'll be a number of politicians and and just and the the um, council, local city councillors and, and the and the councillors from around around the around the Canterbury that they all, all turn up at the show and it's it's lovely to have them there. It's a it's a great um, it's a great time to be in, in Christchurch uh, this this, this cup and show week. There's, there's a lot happening and it's, and with Canterbury having such a wonderful spring, uh, it's it's just the spirits are very high. And the show. You've got an eye for stock. Has the stock come through nicely? Stock have come through very well. It's been a, it's um in some areas the drought's been has been hard, uh, but the the last few months have been just terrific really, the growth has come in, it's been warm, we had a very um, warm late spring and we got into spring very, uh, warm late winter and we got into spring very quickly so, and it's, got, it's well set up for the summer now. Will you have a good three days and, thank you Rob, and, you know, it's, it is a big, let's hold the weather hold. Let's, let's, let's hold, well, a shower or two doesn't matter, but um, as long as it's not less than fine on the Friday, that's, that's, that's the big day, so thank you. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. 
It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try Groshaw Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with Groshaw from KiwiCare. Chris Vero is obviously a big corporate sponsor. It's a great opportunity, I suppose, to meet a lot of your, your clients. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we like to put a bit back into our clients. We're, um, we've been in farm insurance in New Zealand for over 100, 150 years. Uh, and we don't often get in contact with our customers, so we just like to give a wee bit back to them. Um, we've got a marquee here at the stand next to the cattle lawn, so they can come in. Uh, we sponsor the livestock pavilion, so they come in, have a coffee with us, have a wee bite to eat, get out of the rain if it's raining, and um, and yeah, and we just have a chat to us. We're not there to pressure them into buying insurance, we're just there to have a chat and say good day. In fact, you can't sell them insurance, can you? No, no. They, we direct them, if they wanted to. Uh, buy insurance off them, off us, we're um, most willing to, to sell it to them of course, but they have to go via a broker, so we just direct them to a broker of their choice and uh, they, they'll come back to us and we can we can insure them that way. Let's talk about brokers because they're unsung heroes. They are, they're, they're very, very valuable in the insurance world and for customers what they do is uh, they provide advice, uh, they can obviously market and get a good price for them uh, and that's uh, to the customer's advantage of course, but also in in the claims time they're a very good advocate for the client so if the claim was could be covered may not be covered the broker will get in the air sort them give them the right advice of what to do how to approach it and also negotiate with us as well and because uh, they're very knowledgeable and so it's the advantage over a direct insurer where they've got they've got no one to give them that advice and if the claims declined they've got nowhere else to go and I know because I'm through a broker and yes. Vero is my insurance company ah, well but, done. Perfect. but my broker uh, Crombie Lockwood gave me all sorts of stuff that I had no idea I could get. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And and that's and that's their role is to um, help out. And so insurance companies now sort of um, downplayed on staff and things, so they can can go through brokers, um, and brokers provide all the advice that we're used to. So uh, we solely go. In, it's called intermediated. So there's an intermediary in between us and the customer. So that's why it's great on days like today or, or at the AMP show that we can actually sit back and get the customers to come in. We're not trying to sell them anything. We're just saying, g'day, thanks. Here we are. We're in insurance. Uh, we're Vero and we do rural. I guess insurance brokers can be categorised as chartered accountants. I mean, you're not expected to know, are you? Yeah, that's right. Exactly, exactly. So it's um, and and because because we are intermediated, we don't heavily advertise. Um, we used to have the bull on the China shop ad, and that and that got a few fans, and that's great. Um, and so now we're more concentrating on looking after our customer, elevating our customer, and our, and seeing what we can do to help our customers. So. With insurance, uh, with rural insurance especially, we've got a wide range of things where we can we cover their business, their farm, also their home life, the kids going to university, we've got a cover for them, for their contents and things like that. So we're trying to um, involve ourselves in as, mu as much of the, as we can of their lives. We're also um, aligned with a company called Asteron who look after the life side and looking for a health insurance option as well. So we're trying to cover them, encompass all their needs in one go. Bit of competition. <laughs> Well, obviously they're voicing their approval. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, big, big three days for you. Yeah, big three days. It's, it's going to be long three days, but great three days. We really like to get down here and, and support AMP uh, and support the Maya Foundation as well. We're aligning with them, um, asking for donations for the coffee to go to the Maya, which is supporting the Children's Hospital here. So, yeah, very happy to be here. Claren, you won't agree with me, but you're actually pretty knowledgeable and are quite famous about cattle. Whoa, well, I thank you for that, Rob. <laughs> now, I have been working at it for a few years. You certainly have. Yeah. Now, the standard for this year? Uh, we're very pleased with the cattle that have come forward, Rob. Yeah, very pleased. You've got a very strong Angus section here, 
and we've got the privilege of having an international judge from Scotland. His name just happens to be Willie McLaren, so I'm going to claim him as a relation. <laughs> It's important that you do have international judges come in though, isn't it? Well, the interesting thing with Willie is that the family have imported quite a few, quite a bit of New Zealand genetics over the years. So he understands New Zealand cattle. They're not, they're not foreign to him, so to speak. So, as an industry, I mean, we don't hear too much about it. We hear about dairying, but how's, how's the, the beef industry going? Well, the beef industry is quite strong at the moment here. Yeah. There's a big demand for young stock to take through, and the shed will have been the, the market price has been pretty solid, so it's uh, it's all looking firm, yeah, solid. Mm. The bull sales, how did they go? Because there was a there's bit been of... some very good yielding bull sales, both Timania and Cocker who had great sales. Mm. And so the future for for beef is still very very much there. Yes, I believe so. There's now a worldwide interest in our grass-fed systems, where a lot of the beef cattle elsewhere are feed, feedlot finished. In New Zealand, we specialise in grass-fed cattle, and there's now becoming quite an interest from more sure, sure for that product, a more natural product. So we've moved away from those big, long-legged things that with a whole lot of American blood in oh, them. Oh well, yes, we need to be careful when we say American blood because Americans have all sorts of cattle. They've got such a huge gene pool. So you can go to America and pick any type you like. You can still find the big ones. But you can also find the smaller, efficient ones. Mm. So genetics, we've got a pretty good base now as far as the... Herbs. Oh yes, it's in this. The beef cattle, both likes of Hereford and Angus, are in pretty good heart. They've got enough choice to work with and a variance throughout their breed to suit conditions. How important is showing for a, a stud breeder? Well, it gives them some profile. It gives the breeder a chance to talk to maybe a commercial breeder and get them interested in what they're doing within their program. And it may end up, may result in them making a sale. Do the commercial people actually come and have a look? Yes, they do. I guess an A&P show such as this is an ideal chance for the government to communicate with the voters. It certainly is, Rob, and um, there are certainly a large number of people here that uh, we talk to, not just farmers, but a lot of the, the local people live in town, and they're quite interested in what um, the National Party is doing in their area. Because you are doing quite a bit without giving you a chance to, to soapbox. <laughs> We are, and um, around WorkSafe, around uh, the water issues, um, clean water. So I think, like, I come from a, a farming background as well, not in the Canterbury region, but in another region. And uh, WorkSafe and um, safety on motorbikes and machinery and that is really key. And it's, I think it's really stepped up uh, the farming community and the ability to make sure that everybody is kept safe and to reduce the number of motorbike accidents, motor accidents, drownings and things like that. So I think it's been good. It's not only just good for the farmers, I think it's good for the Compliance is something that makes most farmers shudder. Oh, yes. but, but you know, you, you've got to have it. That's right, you do. Um, yeah, you do have to have it because you can't have people going onto your property that you don't know that they're there and then an accident happens. You can't have that. So I think it's good that farmers these days have a little notice on their um, on entrances to their properties to say to always um, check in with the management to get that they're coming onto their farms. And that's good because it gives the farmers the, the ability to monitor the people on and off the farm. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a, it's a good it's a good idea. Farmers don't like it, but they're coming to the party and they're coming to it in a big place. Well, if they don't come to it, they're going to get either fined or they're going to be sued by somebody's family. That's right, they will. <laughs> and that's, that's what compliance is all about at times. But what I've found, um, my husband's a farmer, and when he first heard about it, he wasn't too happy about it. But now that he's really he's got in on, and on board with it, and they've had a number of seminars, not just um, through um, you know, um, farming companies, but also through the banks as well. And now he's really staunch. So you know, when people come on, he goes, make sure you've got this on and that on, and you're doing this and that. And so I think once farmers come on board with it, they become a very good monitor of making sure that everybody's compliant.
And there's a whole lot of assistance as far as programs are concerned as well. There is some assistance for that, and that's um, what I was saying um, just before. I said there's a lot of training and information available to the farmers just so they can pick it all up and, and implement it themselves. And Joe, mental health is something that I champion. That's a major concern in rural areas still. It is. Um, it is. People that are under a lot of pressure, you know, they've got um, big mortgages, um, and when the when the market's down, the pressure comes on there. Um, I used to work in the mental health area. I used to fund mental health in the central, and so I could I saw a lot of that, a lot of the suicide prevention work. I worked in that as well, and you see farmers go under a lot of pressure, and so with some of the programs that we're putting in, it's actually helping them and their families, because mental health just isn't about the farmer, it's about the whole family as well, because and the community, you've got to bring the family and the community on board with it as well, so we're doing our best. And how are things in the Manawatu? Very good, lush, <laughs> lush compared to some parts of Canterbury, yeah. Dave, the Corridor breed is very focused on the commercial buyer as well, aren't they? They are, and I think they've got to become even more so. I mean, it's the commercial uh, producer that you've got to satisfy here in the stud arena. The, the sheep here today have got to have those true Corridor characteristics that can be uh, ongoing to the producer, and he's got to appreciate them. And, if the Corridor breed can regain some of the lost territory that they've lost, obviously, with uh, crossbreeding, well then, uh, I believe if they have that commercial orientation approach, then it, it'll just automatically slot in. Because they are a true dual-purpose sheep? Correct, very much so. And meat is just as important in the Corridor breed, or any other dual-purpose breed for that matter, as wool. I feel wool's only about a fifth of the equation meets about four fifths so I'm a more concentration on meat but I also believe in the dual purpose uh, sheep area that we've got to concentrate on temperament and uh, attitude of the sheep for ease of management and also for the finished product I believe we get a tenderer meat with a quieter animal. So looking at the breed they were sort of known to be able to just dust and stones and they're okay. Big apart. As, being, as meaning that they'll do they'll do very well in very dry conditions. Oh they do. They've always been renowned for that. And Jimmy Little invented the breed for that very purpose. And uh, a, a lot of the general public and a lot of producers have, have gotten that. And now that we've had droughts in North Canterbury, it's brought it home a little bit. The, the, the chickens have come home to roost. And uh, the Corridor breed has come out and proved what it can do. Whereas a lot of these other breeds, cross breeds, have been found wanting. Now this particular ewe, you, you've, you've judged very, very well. She's a good looking animal. What have you looked for? Uh, just the commercial traits that that ewe's obviously got. She's got a magnificent carcass, tremendous loin. And to rear two good lambs like that and to have the muscling that that ewe's got on is a credit to her. It's a credit to her genetics. That, you just can't feed that or make it. Uh, it, it comes within the genetics of that uh, particular strain and uh, it, she's a great example both for a Coral registered breed and for a commercial ewe. She just fit, ticks all the boxes and I indicated in the ring there that she's got that X factor that uh, a lot of sheep haven't got. You know, they can be good but it's that little bit extra that gives them that uh, final analysis and hence she became champion. So for a commercial breeder, how important is coming to the Canterbury a and show and, and seeing these animals? I think it's very important. I've always believed that the farmers should come here. I mean, we've gone into a figure orientation period and there are figures here now, there are still figures. That you had an index of 1300, nearly 1400, 1394, which is exceptional. And it shows there in the lambs. I'm not a sill fanatic as such. I still believe you've got to have a live animal with a good head and the temperament, as I've already explained, the figures have got to match that. And uh, so that's where, where I come from. China, you've just come over for the AMP show? Yes, that's it. So, obvious question, it's a long way to come, so why are you here? Well, we thought um, to trace some genetics and we want to trace from the uh, best origins um, that possibly we can. So, we came here to see Arthur and uh, he's helping us to choose the right breed for us for our milk production. 
Because Arthur Blake is quite famous as an exporter of our genetics. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I spoke to a couple of friends and they have uh, connections and they, you know, they tell me Arthur is the one to, to speak to if you need to say anyone. Is there any particular breed, Clark? Well, we heard the East Frisian is the best milk production um, breed and so we want to join them with our local meat breed to create our own uh, particular breed that we can use uh, later on. So East Frisian is what we're looking for. Uh, he's shown us a couple from uh, his other connections, but uh, we're just here to see what else we can see. I know it sounds a loaded question, but your thoughts so far, are the sheep in good shape? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, getting where we want it, so yeah. And you, look, you must be looking for sires, are you, or are you looking for ewes as well? Uh, we're looking, the best way to get to where we want it is uh, frozen semen. So uh, we possibly could look into some rams later on, but at this stage it's frozen semen. And you're getting a bit of time to actually look at the animals? Yeah, we did, we did. We went to the, um, Auckland yesterday to see some rams and then here we are to see the rest of them. Well, enjoy this. And how long are you here for? Till later this afternoon, and I will fly back. <laughs> so Tight schedule. A flying trip then. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, have a good afternoon. Thank you very Cheers. much. Cheers. So, Arthur, we've just been talking about you. We better talk to you. The importance of international trade. Well, Rob, as you know, I've been involved with it for a, a very long time. And uh, yeah, it's very important to New Zealand to have our genetics being used around the world. And I'm lucky enough today to have two gentlemen here with me from China. Uh, one of them who lives in Australia and one who's come directly from Beijing. And they're interested at this stage of importing uh, East Frisian semen for a milking operation. Now, talking about semen rather than animals at this stage, is that, is that the easiest way of doing it? Well, I think it is because the F, the F is and the F rate are all so expensive. Um, and uh, they have the technology now to handle uh, inseminations. So, uh, yeah, that's the way they've chosen to go. It's not just China, but, but China is a very big market, I'd imagine. Well, I think it's going to become a bigger market. Of course, you know, my work is traditionally with South America and Mexico. Uh, so for me, it's a, new, a bit of a new venture. So we we'll look forward to see how it goes. But you've never walked away from a venture yet. No, I've uh, got pretty close sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>
um, systems, we also have um, contacts with them once they fill out a form to keep in touch with us. So, um, that's a big part of following up on, yeah. on them as well. And all sorts of events, we're everywhere doing everything throughout the year. It's really exciting and really varied. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Is farming becoming sexy for the young people? Oh, well, we'd like to think so. I mean, some of the um, opportunities that exist there are definitely very inspiring. We also do an initiative called Soil Makes Sense, where we get fresh graduates to go into schools, present about what they're doing now, the sort of um, things they've got to do day to day, the pay scales they might be on, and sort of, you know, open students' eyes to the jobs that do exist and that agriculture doesn't necessarily mean just gumboots. You know, there's some really cool careers out there and it's, yeah, like you said, bringing the sexy back to agriculture, I guess. It's strange, it is a lot more than gumboots and dairy cows. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the when you look at the jobs that are actually involved from just you know for the farmer to get to that point whereas in gumboots you know milking the cows every day is the jobs just go on and on um, and it's and sometimes the jobs that not everyone realizes that exist um, that actually keep industry churning and moving so um, part of our job is trying to actually uh, encourage and promote those jobs mm. that people not necessarily think about from day to day um, and it's as Sophie had said before it's those jobs and recreation and also in um, commerce opportunities that actually you know add um, support and um, what we call allied industries to, mm. to agriculture as a whole. So if you obviously isolation isn't a problem now with organisations like Young Farmers and that's party time for people in the country. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We've got the youngest, um, the biggest young farmers group in the South Island. South Island, Island. yeah. It's, it's, sorry, it's big. I can't remember the exact fact around it, but yeah, no, it's definitely very social. There's lots of opportunities to sort of be able to, you know, network and meet people from similar backgrounds. And universities are a really cool time to be able to do that because the connections you make, they they last a lifetime. I mean, here at the AMP show today, half of the sites for recruitment, half of the sites for alumni. And we spent all morning talking to people that have studied at Lincoln University over the years and now they're coming back and they're passionate about their time and they're telling us great stories and reminiscing about really fun times and it's really neat to see. <laughs>
local fruit from Nelson. And I believe I'm also the only producer of uh, absinthe. So what's in the absinthe? Absinthe is a anise and fennel and wormwood um, um, distillate. I've, a lot of the ingredients, again, are from my own garden. And we macerate it in brandy which I get from local wineries. I get the wine from wineries in Nelson. I distill the wine into brandy and then I macerate um, botanicals in it. And then it is distilled. It comes out clear and transparent as water from the still. And then we macerate it a second time, again with, with wormwood, um, mint balm and, um, and mint. What a lovely profession you've ended up in. Oh, I do it. I have a passion. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Mind your own business. Now, normally that would be something you wouldn't say to many people, but for you, it's got a different meaning. Yeah, absolutely. So MYOB, or Mind Your Own Business, we're all about helping businesses succeed, uh, especially in the agricultural space. Um, but we cover businesses of all shapes and sizes, from your small one-man bands all the way up to your much larger businesses. It is complicated and it is a minefield. Yep, absolutely. So for businesses to really get their heads around from all sorts of compliance changes, from managing GST all the way through to managing, especially if you're managing staff, um, it can be really tough. Managing a PAYE, making sure you're all sorted with things like holiday pays. There's been huge amounts of stuff in the press around uh, working out on holiday pays. That's the beauty of having great online accounting and payroll software, is actually it does a hell of a lot of the work for you. Does it save a whole lot of money when you go to the accountant for the end of year summary? Well, I'm probably not the one to be able to tell you in terms of how much money it can save, but absolutely. I mean, in terms of the benefits of having online accounting and payroll software is the fact that actually you just make sure you can really work with your accountant all the time. You don't leave it all the way through to the end of the year. So you can fix up the books all the way through. So actually when it comes to the end of the year, you don't get some huge, great shocker of a bill that comes through and it's like, oh my God, where the hell did that come from? You know how you're going all the way through. Lots of our customers do actually tell us that actually it has really reduced their compliance-based bills with their accounts. Mountains. Is it easy to follow because not everybody is that far up the tree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, the whole point is to make the solution so super simple that no matter what type of business you're running, that you can really manage the books by yourself. But the great thing is with the MYOB, you can link in an accountant or a bookkeeper or a business advisor who can help you do the books all at the same time. So there's great solutions out there that help you save time, but also link directly in with the IRD. So for example, your GST, you can automatically push your GST directly through uh, to the IRD. Um, and so you don't have to worry about it it's just so super simple so when IRD for example changed the rules and regulations about amount of homestead that you can claim yeah yeah absolutely you, you, you guys re reprogram well that's right so no matter when um, the compliance changes are taking place usually we tend to find they take place at the first of April and then f the start of the new tax year um, and so all that happens with the online accounting software the great thing is that it automatically updates so that you never have to worry that you're not on the right side of the IRD because it, it is changing constantly though. That's right, and that's the whole point of making sure you've got up-to-date software. Because often we can find with some businesses, they're, kind of, they're not compliant because they've got old software that they haven't updated for many, many years. And that's a great thing about having an online solution, the online accounting and payroll, that you're constantly up-to-date with all the new changes that are taking place. So how does it work? Do you, does somebody register and then they just click in and out when they want to? Yeah, so in terms of a great thing to do is to go online, go onto the myb.com website, you can take a free trial and you literally you just download the, download um, and subscribe right online and so then you're, you're ready to go. You can then invite an advisor through, all you'd have to do is just click a button, send them an email address and they're invited in to be able to access the accounts exactly the same time as you. Cost. So cost varies depending on um, the type of package that you need, but anywhere from $18 a month. Um, our standard package for probably the majority of New Zealand businesses is $40 a month, so it's not a huge investment at all. Um, and that is, even includes um, payroll as well. So it's great value for businesses to have that peace of mind and to save so much time. We know that our solutions probably save businesses on average about 10 hours of work every month. And you think about if you valued your time and what 10 hours could work, will be worth for you, um, it will be so much more than $40 a month. And it's catching on? 
Absolutely. We've got so many of our, especially our desktop customers that we've had for many, many years. MYB's been in business for 25 years. Um, and so we've got a huge number of businesses who are now moving and upgrading to the cloud. And then, of course, for new businesses coming on board to MYOB, um, we're just we're having a fantastic year this year. We've seen huge amounts of innovation in our product and, yeah, really proud of it. Shopping area is always a big crowd puller. Yep. So well, yeah, what makes it so wonderful? I think it's a bit of variety, isn't it? You don't see this sort of thing very often, and you have to come to the show to see it in this sort of volume. There's a lot of competitors here, and the crowd do appreciate it. They do get a lot out of it. So it is a sport, but a lot of people don't even sort of, you don't hear people saying, I'm a wood chopper. No. Uh, Three, Toss up whether it's a sport four. or an entertainment. We'd look at it as a sport, but the crowd, obviously, it's a straight five. entertainment. We'll I don't think they understand the concept of how we work it, Seven but they just like seeing it done. Mm. And there's and a big following. I mean, there's people from all around Australasia here. Yeah. Uh, and from further afield, um, Americans, Peter, Canadians, you name it, they all come. And is there enough young people coming through? Oh, we'd like so to see a lot more. Be, uh, but uh, it's a hard sport to actually get into in that respect. Not a lot of money attached to it unless you're in the very top level. Um, and obviously family take precedence, so that's basically a philosophy we have. The family comes first, so this fits in after family. There's a lot of big men involved. Oh, oh yes, 160, 170 kilos, some of them. Uh, it doesn't follow that the bigger ones are the better ones. I've known some very good smaller ones. And how fit do you guys have to be? Well, we'd range from terribly unfit to very, very fit. It just depends on your goals right, we and need the names aspirations of the North Island in this team, please. Mm. And you obviously got a the PA man who's fairly loud. Yes, <laughs> but that's all part of hype, isn't it? It is, and it's part of engaging the crowd and what we do, actually. So, yeah, uh, uh, sometimes we think things like that are a nuisance, but it's essential for the well-being of the crowd that they know what's going on and people keeping them involved. And safety? Uh, absolute rules. Uh, you're not allowed to do this unless you're competent. If you want to do some training, that's fine. But, but it is essential that it is done well. And we have some strict rules on it. At any time, there can only be competitors and organised officials in the arena. No one else is permitted. And you don't see you don't see people losing feet, despite the fact that there's a very sharp axe swinging. Well, they started putting out the things that uh, butchers and freezing workers use on their hands, and they use them now for the feet. So it's a mesh guard. So it's more difficult to actually hurt yourself these days. Uh, I don't use them because I'm old and know what I'm doing, but for the young ones it's kind of important that they look after themselves, so yeah. Jeff, it's, it is another huge event as far as everybody's concerned. Oh, it's huge, it's getting bigger. It's exciting, yeah, no, it's been a, uh, a hell of a journey getting to this one. I can tell you now, we've built this new Enduro Cross Track, so that's a huge new thing for the show. We had a smaller event last year, this year it's gotten bigger. Um, obviously the equestrian is as big as it's ever been and our cattle, we're all cattle event this year and numbers are up and numbers last year were up in cattle so they, it's growing. So how do you do that? Um, you just you stay engaged with people. Someone comes into your office and they've got an idea, you listen and you figure out how to help them. So you know my business and my team are all about enabling volunteers <laughs> to do their thing. So you know you, you have such a mix of characters that come into the show you, the first thing you do is you never judge anybody because the craziest people can create the most amazing things. So we listen, we figure out how to do things and we give them a shot and, uh, and then they create stuff and some of it's cool. Have you seen the Wall of Death by the Enduro Cross? No, we've got to go and have a look at it. Go and have a look at it, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean that, that's old AMP show, when I was knee high to a perching puller we used to do the Wall of Death. Yeah, well, it's back. Good things never die. <laughs> and the weather, I mean this is Wednesday. Beautiful day, yeah. Like all the farmers are here. Um, all the city kids are here, they're enjoying this beautiful day. I mean, these crowds, it's packed, it's, it's awesome. It's going to get better. And entertainment wise, I mean, you bring a lot of entertainment into what was normally a AMP show. Yeah, no, we do. Well, I think 
know, people want to see everything, but they also want to sit down and be entertained, and they're you know, paying to get through the door, so we'd like to give them as much value as we can. So Jodie Doreen's playing at the moment, she's an amazing country singer. Come Friday, we'll have people from like, you know, Yee and Anas with Jason Kerrison from Hop Shop and James Reed from The Feelers and um, someone from Fur Patrol. There's like a really cool acts coming along. And if you've got kids, the Court Theatre have three amazing acts you watch for free on, a, on their own little children's stage. It's awesome. So what we can do really is congratulate you and say, see if you can top this one next year. I congratulate my team, they do all the work. I just, <laughs> I just asked them nicely to get it done. <laughs> well, it's bloody successful. Yeah, no, it's good, we enjoy it. That's what we're here for. So there we are, just to back up what Jeff was saying, it is a very successful show and that's just a very small percentage of the characters and what there is to see here. So many people put so many hours into it so that so many others can enjoy it. Congratulations, Canterbury A&P. Next week, we'll be telling you how far are going to save you millions of dollars across the nation in the fight against grass scrubs. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.